Have you had any wrist pain from playing guitar? Maybe tendonitis? Have you maybe been struggling with arthritis, shoulder pain, back pain, any sort of physical discomfort from playing the guitar? These are not uncommon issues. Almost all of us are going to have to grapple with something like this over our guitar playing lifetime. Well, in this episode, I am interviewing the wonderful doctor of physical therapy, Abby Halpin. Abby has a business called Forte Performance and Physical Therapy, and she specializes in working with performing artists, instrumentalists, musicians, and she works with a lot of guitarists and singers as well. Abby helped me when I had an arm issue, extreme tendonitis, and uh, we got along great and have stayed in touch since then. So I'm going to interview her and we're going to go over all of the possibilities of guitar physical problems, general and specific, that anyone might come across. She's going to share a ton of information and wisdom about how she helps guitarists both prevent and treat injuries such as wrist pain, shoulder pain, you know, all the things that could happen to us and uh, have discomfort. There's a lot of great little nuggets in here. It's a long interview, uh, but uh, if there's something specific you're looking for, you can check it out um, with the outline in the description on YouTube or just listen through and soak it in and you'll gain something from it for sure about how to stay healthy, uh, physically speaking, and have a better relationship with the guitar, not burn out, not get injured, or maybe start your journey on recovering from an injury if that's something that you are suffering with. <laughs> I'll give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover in this interview, just so you can poke around and find something specific that you might be looking for, or just listen to the whole thing. But the first portion of it is very much about general advice for all of us, whether we're suffering from an injury or not, just how to be physically healthy as a guitarist, really valuable stuff. And then the second portion or later in the interview, we go over really specific uh, symptoms, wrist pain, tendonitis, arthritis, shoulder pain, thumb pain, back pain, elbow pain, forearm pain, tingling, hands falling asleep. Uh, these are things that uh, clients come to Abby uh, suffering from and she helps them. So we're going through and they're common things that can happen to guitarists, physically speaking. But we talk about preventing um, issues in general, posture, wrist angle, breathing, uh, you know, how, why injuries happen, you know, how possible it is to recover from them. Um, it's a really excellent conversation. I talk about a warm up a couple times in there and warming up is really important to me and you'll hear more about why. If you want to get the PDF uh, of the exact exercise warm up that I do every single time I practice guitar, you can get it with the link in the description if you're watching on YouTube or you can go to soundguitarlessons.com slash warm up to get the notation and tabs of that exercise. Okay, let's jump into the interview. Abby, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. This is going to be so beneficial for so many guitarists. And I know from experience that it is a harrowing and miserable journey to be suffering from an injury or be worrying about your playing physically. And you helped me out so much when I was struggling with some of that stuff. And I want to pick your brain here. We're going to go through so many things uh, to talk about injury prevention um, and recovery and just giving us the, it, Abby's going to give us the the lowdown for everything we need to know about guitar physical health. Abby is a specialist who works with specifically instrumentalists and singers and uh, has a business called Forte Performance and Physical Therapy. She's a doctor of physical therapy. So this is going to be really great. We actually did a video years ago that's on the channel it got a bunch of views because people you know people are looking for solving their problems when they have issues like wrist pain and tendonitis and stuff and we're going to talk about all that today so so really this is part two abby is back on the channel but abby thank you again for for being here and also quickly uh if anybody wants to throw a congratulations in the comments abby just had a baby recently and uh, an adorable baby she sent me a picture but but now how how old is the baby uh, let's see, she was born in September, so by the time this comes out, she'll be a little over one. So congrats to Abby. Uh, I can't believe your baby is almost a year old. That is totally crazy. So uh, yeah, Abby and I know good. each other because I taught her husband guitar lessons for a while, and Abby's actually a wonderful singer. Um, and I got to hear her sing because I was helping her husband with uh, some guitar arrangements, and she was singing along, and it was it was a good time. So we've been in touch since then. Um, so I'll share quickly just... 
a little bit about my tendonitis, then we're going to turn it over to Abby's expertise, and she's going to share a ton. We're going to go through um, a bunch of general questions and also specific problems and how she helps people and treats all kinds of physical problems that people might have who are guitarists. Um, I had tendonitis and various hand and wrist issues from playing guitar three separate times in my um overall guitar lifetime two times were really serious like i had to i it was like so painful that that i couldn't play and it was terrifying and these are spread out over over probably 10 years so i had it happen when i was in college and at the time it's just a devastating experience i thought i maybe would never be able to play again or i would never be able to play at the same capacity um, and then it got better and then 10 years later or so at, at least um, it happened again, and this is when Abby helped me out, and I went to her for some for some physical therapy. Um, and one of the things that Abby told me early on, because I asked her, I was like, "Is it true that I might never, you know, play at the same level? Like having an injury like this, an overuse tendonitis injury, could I maybe not be able to recover or get back to full strength?" And Abby just gave me a lot of hope. And she said, no, that you can totally have a full recovery, even as bad as it you know, feels like it is right now. And that was amazing and really gave me hope to, to, to work through it. The other thing I want to say that was incredible and mind blowing to me is, is that the issue seemed to stem from places that I had no idea were a problem. And I'm sure this is a common theme for you, Abby, and for physical therapists, that I was having problems here. So I thought, oh, okay, it's all about this. And the exercises Abby gave me worked on some like lower back stuff that were on the, uh, the other side of my body in the lower back. I don't know how or why, but I did the exercises diligently. There's some, so you know, various things. Um, and it wasn't like the only thing that did it because I was trying everything, but it was incredible to realize, oh, wow, some weakness way over here can cause, you know, tension and all kinds of other problems. And so um, it, that's, why, that's why we need the professionals like Abby. So, uh, so Abby, first, if you could maybe just share anything you want to say about kind of a, what I feel like you helped me with early on, which is just that sense of hope, right? If someone is struggling mm. with it, like you've seen so many people have terrible physical issues and also seen a lot of recoveries too. I just want people to know that if they're struggling with something that it is possible to recover from it. And we're also going to talk about preventative stuff too, but let's start with this. Yeah. Um, I feel like a lot of times that's like the very first conversation I have with people. Uh, you know, the question is like, am I ever going to be able to play guitar again or mm -hmm. play guitar at the level I was or the performance schedule that I had? Um, and Yes, yes. You just need to find the resources and do some problem solving. Um, and um, in general, find the stimulus for what's contributing to your experience and make a change. And that's, mm -hmm. I, I, it's really more about problem solving and mm -hmm. um, trying to continue to play as much as feels good in the meantime. Um, and so if you're struggling with something, Find the resources you need because there is always a solution, um, or at least there is an outcome that that can feel good over time. Yeah, and hopefully this video is you know maybe one of the first steps in that process, and that's why it's such an important thing to say first, which is basically don't give up. Don't give up on the possibility of recovering unless you really have something unique and someone <laughs> tells you that it's that, you know, if if there's something more serious going on, who knows? There's all kinds of issues out there. But the typical overuse kind of injuries, my understanding of it now is is just how really what a huge takeaway for me is how amazingly resilient the body is and how mm -hmm. your body will take care of you and heal itself if you give it the right circumstances and if you give it the right yes. you know if you if you do a number of things in terms of taking care of yourself and including exercise or whatever but you know get a second opinion third opinion fourth opinion and and don't give up on recovery um because that's a very that's a very sad thing and I, i'm not the physical therapy expert here but it seems to me that more people are having re successful recovery stories than i had to quit forever stories right so sometimes i think it's just perseverance to get through it. A hundred percent. This is also the hole that I have found in healthcare is a lot of healthcare providers don't, <laughs> don't maybe think that 
music is a thing to keep going. Like, you know, there's oh. a lot of the, oh, if it hurts, then stop playing. Um, and that's getting better, but that's still a message that musicians will will hear from time to time. And if you are in that category, you who is listening to this right now, um, find another healthcare provider. <laughs> I know it's yeah. work and it's not it's not always easy, but find the person who's going to say, I see that this is important to you. Let's find the way to make it happen. I love that. That's really great. Um, I have had experiences like that before, even as even as someone that has been making a living off of music, people will still mm -hmm. diminish, no pun intended, <laughs> diminish my, you know, <laughs> my, my need for it. And, and so someone might a, a you know a doctor might even feel like oh your hobby like maybe you know take up something else but professional or not you know getting paid for it or not for us most of us playing music it's such a it's like an existential need you know it's not really about it's not just a random hobby you can replace with something else so yeah I appreciate yeah. that that's that's really powerful that you meet your clients there you know that you're yeah it's also just built into the like the system soup that we live in i mean insurance companies are saying that you know music is not medically necessary i hate that term medically necessary um mm. because medically necessary and meaningful to person don't always overlap um mm. and mm -hmm. so you, you just kind of have to you just have to find the resources that's what it is and that's you know that's what people are doing right now looking yeah. for these types of videos it's funny to push back on that when music is also there's plenty of evidence that music is a, a great healer you know music therapy is actually and you know maybe not in the united states as much but in other countries it's it's uh you know insurance will cover some music therapy and and it is therapeutic we all know that right that's why we're here <laughs> that's why we're doing it you know and it's necessary <laughs> and yeah it's yeah and we know it is you know it's necessary for for the soul right so let's talk yeah. about um how long recovery might take um mm. and you know we're already talking about being persistent being patient and of course this is just gonna depend but if you have any words on just how long recovery might take if someone is finding themselves at that point of injury yeah, it kind of depends on what someone's dealing with um, and some of the other, you know, variables and factors of life. Um, but a general rule of thumb is if you can find what contributing factors are, exist, then you also need to allow for healing time after that. You can't just take away those factors and then expect an immediate change. There may be some partial change immediately, um, but you do have to allow for just general healing time. And that can look different if it's an incident that just happened, you know, like an ankle sprain where you're like, oh, now my ankle's all swollen and purple. Um, tissue healing time in terms of like things knitting themselves back together is about six to eight weeks. That doesn't mean you can't expect um, a change in your experience or a change in how well you can play it within those six to eight weeks. You can often just, you know, feel the improvement along the way. Um, but for something more kind of on and off. Oh, it's happened every couple of months for 10 years. <laughs> you know, those common stories that we hear, it can take longer than that tissue healing time to really make a long term change, because you have to allow the nervous system to recalibrate, it needs to um, determine that something is not marked as dangerous as it used to be. Um, so we have an, just basically an internal alert system of this. The pain is basically your brain going, something might be dangerous. I'm going to give you a pain feeling so that you get yourself out of danger. It's a safety mechanism. It's, I always think of it as like, thank you. Thank you. There's like some cute yeah. little fuzzy person being oh, like, yeah. hey, get yourself out of the scenario. Right. Um, but we need to recalibrate what causes the alert and that is what can take a long time when it's something that's been around for a while that's wonderful response um i there does seem to be a trend of i believe this is kind of on the rise as opposed to as opposed to the way people thought about illness and injury in the past and mental health certainly and trauma and stuff like that 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 um you're we are you know, complex beings that we have multiple, you know, we're, we're made up of multiple parts, multiple parts of our brain. And one part of you, your nervous system, you're, you know, you're getting signals in one way while you're trying to push back on it in another way. So I love this kind of being kind to the symptoms in a way, 
you know, like, oh, you know, thank you for trying to help me here and let's work on this together instead of, you know, what did I do wrong? Why, you know, why is this like, you know, positive thinking mindset stuff, which anyone who watches any of my guitar videos, you know, I, I, I like that stuff in general. Right. Um, but yeah. And, and it's, that's nice to hear also about just, Hey, the physical body, I guess it, it's going to depend on age and, and health, um, and immune system response and stuff like that. But six to eight weeks, like if, if straight up your tissue has to heal, um, you know, that's, that's a long time. Um, and also let's just all appreciate for a second that we are creatures that can regenerate. It's the, I was thinking about this recently. I was like, it is the cr craziest, most <laughs> amazing thing. Like, uh, it's like, we take everything for granted. Uh, of course, cause it just is the way it is. You know, I got a, a cut on my, on my hand and just watching it heal over, you know, over the next week, it's just like, this is mind blowing that, that your body can just like, can just heal. Like that would be a superpower. If we couldn't do that, we would all, you know, think of it as science fiction. And, but it's like, we actually do that. It's amazing. So anyway, my little, my little. Absolutely. It is science uh, fiction. If we could watch it in, in full speed, right. With that yeah, is part of like superpower right. movies. Yeah. Right. And we just do right. it, you know, at a human speed. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just incredible to reflect on that and, and just to, to know, you know, I can heal, you know? And I think when I have, um, whatever very, if I have whatever various types of problems, even if I'm just, even if it's just stress or something like that, like to try to consciously remind myself, like you can heal from this or like this can, you know, your body can take care of you again, if you give it the space that it needs. And I feel like for me anyway, that helps me do that. So the belief in, you know, in my, I, I tell you, my arm was messed up. Like I, and I was playing professionally and teaching. So that's why it, it was, even more of a problem and and it it was drawn out for a long time but it was like on mm -hmm. fire like i if i played one note it would you know flare up and it's amazing i can play as much as i want now and it's it's not a problem so um we're gonna uh we're gonna talk about um why injuries happen in a second which is going to be helpful for everyone but let me move one of the orders of my question because the next one would be uh really great to ask piggybacking off of that last one which is Mm. when we're having issues w w at whatever level sh you know when do should we completely stop or keep playing a little bit and and you know part of this conversation the value of it is i hope is that abby is such an expert specifically with instrumentalists and worked with a lot of guitar players um and i've worked with a lot of students you know and been playing you know professionally so i'll kind of piggyback in the in my observation of you know guitarists but for myself um and, and what Abby told me when I was having problems was, okay, clearly you can't stop 100% playing. And that actually there are some cases where you, you whether you could or not, you maybe don't want to, because you want to try to find, even maybe in the worst of your injury or problems, find, find some minimum that you can do that's not making it worse. So you are giving those signals to your body that, you know, this is something that needs to keep happening in, instead of, and I've had phases of, taking a break and healing and coming back to it. And it just gets worse again really quickly. Whereas this playing a minimal amount on a regular basis, almost as part of the physical therapy seemed to help me, but I don't want to give the answer here. I'm just sharing my, you know, anecdotes, but, um, you know, when should complete rest happen? When should maybe a little bit of playing, if you have anything to say about that? Yeah. Um, oh my gosh, I have so much to say about that. Um, complete stopping playing is good if you're having severe pain that is like keeping you up at night or lasts for hours after you're done playing, um, or you are seeing like visible signs of structural injury, like bruising, redness, major swelling, um, something where like, maybe you should go to the, to the doctor. <laughs> um, and I so imagine that's if when it's you kind of, so... those are like the red red light yeah. signs. Sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say, I imagine no. also if it's, if when you try to play, it's so painful, you can't handle it. Like pretty obvious time to, you know, yes. not force it. Even if, even if someone said to play a small amount, but go on, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Um, no, I think that's, yeah, it's important. Um, and then I think also if you're finding yourself in the category of like, you're dreading playing, um, or the guitar is not fun anymore. I don't even, 
I don't really want to pick it up. Um, that's kind of getting yourself close to that kind of like red light, like need need proper rest. That's not black and white for real, but or for for sure. But um, but in every other scenario, there is some type or amount or uh, ver- type of guitar <laughs> that you probably can um, keep playing. So that's where that problem solving comes in, um, and it's important to find some way to keep some of your skills going because what you don't want to find yourself in is kind of what you described, Jared, is like this kind of, um, I had called it in a podcast episode, this isn't a real term, but training whiplash, um, where you're like, stop, start, stop, start. And then your poor tissues are like, I don't know what you want from me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So there's like full recovery, sure, but then you're just going back to 100% and then going, I have to take another week off and going back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, There's no time for tissue adaptation for what you would really like your body to be able to do. You want to be somewhat gradual while I'm still having some fun um, in adapting to the amount or the genre or the type or whatever, you know, whatever variable playing variables you can come up with um, so that you can play with those variables to keep things going. Um, If you can't right now tolerate some very kind of more aggressive, like big strumming style, but you can do some like really light finger picking then that's what we do. Um, Or vice versa. You know, it just depends on what your scenario is. Um, But if we can find some way to keep the guitar in your hands um, and keep you adapting to the instrument that you want to play, then that is actually going to be for the betterment. Yeah, amazing. And that was really helpful for me. And when you think about it physically, it makes so much sense that if there's some sort of healing going on, you would want the healing to happen Uh, at the same time as some version of the movement that you eventually want to be doing. Because otherwise, you know, if we're thinking of something like, and I know nothing about, you know, medical healing or anything like that, but if you just think of like scar tissue or something, well, it's known to make things stiffer, rougher, whatever. And so um, if you are, I'm just saying the logic of it here makes sense to me. If you're continuing with the mobility that you want on a very, very minimal level, perhaps the healing uh, works around that, you know, uh, instead of, yeah. Cause I was, I had the whiplash thing. I was going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. Um, and another thought on this, which is that if you can't actually, cause I had, as I said, this, these phases of really that I shouldn't be playing cause it was that bad for me. Um, I worked on a lot of other stuff that was musically beneficial for me. And I have strengths now, you can only see the silver lining in hindsight, but I have strengths now that I would not have musically speaking if I didn't, I would have just kept, I gotta play, 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 play. But I worked on, you know, some ear training and some singing and my left hand was, my left arm was the messed up thing. I worked on a bunch of like classical guitar technique, which Classical guitars, guitarists who have both arms working fine will sit for hours and work on just just their a plucking hand because there's so much to do um, to get a good tone and, and, you know, Giuliani picking patterns and stuff like that. If you're a classical guitarist, you know what I mean? Uh, and <laughs> I guess they're not picking patterns. They're the, the right hand studies. But uh, you could just sit there for hours and, and work on that stuff. So I was still determined to, you know, be working on my musicianship and it was it, it actually leveled up some stuff that would have remained weaknesses for me. So being creative, that's the patience, that's the persistence. One other thought to piggyback off of that 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 comes to mind is that um it's okay to to not play. You know, it's okay to not play in mm-hmm. general. Um, like outside of injuries, because we're talking about, oh, if you're healing, maybe continuing a small amount is going to be helpful. Um, and I talk so much about consistency. And yes, that's important. But more important than consistency, I believe, is intentionality, right? The inconsistency mm-hmm. when we get off, but we don't want to get off, uh, you know, off the bandwagon of, of practicing regularly, that's when it's detrimental intentionality though kind of wins over everything because it's like the whole point of all of this is just made up ideas to satisfy us right to have a good experience and and feelings and and creative time or whatever uh so it just comes to mind because i'm like mr consistent talking about it all the time Mm. but i'm taking two weeks i'm gonna not play guitar for two weeks straight because i'm going on a honeymoon next week and i'm intentionally intentionally 
not bringing a guitar. <laughs> I've taken guitars on vacations plenty of times, and it, it's it's wonderful. It's lovely to have the guitar to, to play around with. Uh, but this time, two weeks, two weeks off, you know, not not playing at all. So I wanted to throw that in, right? That yes, maybe some consistency is important if we're healing, but also some intentional time off is fine. Just a little a little side note there on that. Yes. So. Um, and if you are dealing yeah. with an injury and trying to keep going feels like you're punishing yourself, do not play. That's it's. There's yeah. no win there. This yeah. is if you want to keep playing while you're healing. That's what this can Right, is. right. And you mentioned that earlier too, like if it's feeling like a chore, you know, if you're, if you're dreading it. Um, it's something to watch out for, uh, negative associations with things, you know, something that we used to love, turning it into something we dread. Like all of this is just a construct to get us to get to our, you know, goals and our, you know, just living a life we want to live. And there's so much tricky mental gymnastics going on, right? So if we are dreading something that we thought we wanted, uh, it, there's some perspective, you know, perspective work to do as well. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's go on to the, why do injuries happen? I saw, so Abby has a podcast, uh, that she has posted, um, several episodes on. And the first one was called, why do injuries happen? And, and so great thing to talk about. We need, we should all understand that so we can avoid it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think the first point to be made is we can't avoid them. Mm. We are all going to have pain and injury as part of the human condition. Um, and if you expect to somehow get through scot-free, you are in a dream world. <laughs> um, so the, the just to kind of put that out there, and it's not because something horrible is going to happen to all of us, but there is going to be a challenge at some point. Um, and just to have a plan in place ahead of time is, is where it's at. So having a, having a team, having people around that can support you, etc. Um, but there are variables that we can manipulate in a helpful way. Um, generally injuries happen because we're doing something too much too fast, or the kind of the flip side of that is we didn't do enough. And now all of a sudden we're doing a lot. Um, and that looks like, um, I've been practicing 20 minutes a couple days a week steadily. Yay, that's great. And then all of a sudden, oh, I have a gig on Saturday. Um, I'm going to practice eight hours on Wednesday through Friday. And then I'm going to do that gig. And I'm going to get so excited about that gig that I'm going to do another thing on Sunday, you know, and all of a sudden the volume changes or shifting from practice to performance, the intensity just naturally shifts as it should. Um, so too much or too, too fast kind of looks like that. The not enough all of a sudden is is just the flip of the um, the focus. So, um, like in sports, we talk a lot about overtraining. The what to do about that side is the under recovery, not overtraining. It's the it's, so to me that changes the intentionality mm. about it. Going back to the word intentional, um, talking about under recovery like gives me something to do. Oh, I've under recovered. I better add recovery. And for some reason, that language shift sits better with how my brain happens to work. I'll add recovery to my to-do list <laughs> mm. rather than I'm overtraining. I need to pull back on what I'm doing. That mm. feels kind of icky. feels like I'm taking away a fun thing. Um, it yeah. just kind of changes the the way that's, that sits with me. So um, making sure that we schedule in recovery time and also that we ramp up in a way that feels doable when it's possible. That's not always possible. And that is okay. If all of a sudden you have a surprise gig and you didn't prepare for it, and you're going to do it anyway. I fully support that move. <laughs> um, but when it's possible to ramp up and give yourself time to adapt to what you want to be doing, um, the lack of adaptation is why injuries happen. The I second love, side of that. Ooh, oh, yeah, go, go ahead, ahead, Jared. Well, I just want to say I love the under recovery thing. I mean, that's the whole mental framework thing again, right? And I, I'm like you. I, I It's easier to feel like there's something to do than not do. And you, it might be common to feel like it's a failure or a weakness, you know, if you did something too much and it didn't work out instead of, oh, no, I just mm. I need to add in. Re like recovery is a thing to do. It's not a thing to not do. You know, it's not or playing is not a thing to not do. Recovery is a thing to do. Um, so yes. maybe, and you were going to go on, you know, you feel free to go on with, with what you were going to say, but for guitarists, what might recovery actually look like? Is it just not playing? Is that it? Is, is, mm. is it more time in between, uh, uh, 
sessions. I had a student who very successfully practiced three times a day because they broke up the amount they wanted to practice. It wasn't an insane amount, but it was breaking it up so it wasn't all in one sitting. And that was really helpful for their physical situation. But yeah, yeah recovery, you know, strategy. does it just mean time, you know, making sure we sleep, stuff mm-hmm. like that? Well, there's two types of recovery. There's active recovery where you're still doing something physical. And then there's passive recovery where you're taking like true rest, meaning like you are not touching your instrument. Um, Active recovery, I usually try to uh, problem solve with a client. So if they're like, I need recovery time, I need to schedule it in, but I really like, I just don't like taking days away from the guitar. And this happened, I feel like guitar is specifically... Are, are bad at that. <laughs> getting Take away from the guitar. <laughs> maybe, yes. maybe I'm contributing um, to that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what active recovery can look like is okay, I'm going to play through some of those pieces that I like, I know front and back, you know, like the back of my hand kind of thing. That it's like it feels super easy because it is super easy. Maybe you're doing a genre that like feels really simple to you. Um, or uh shifting into like i'm gonna play this passage a few times just to keep it in my mind rather than a full you know however long your normal practice session is something short so playing with a variable to like take the gas pedal like take your foot off the gas pedal Mm -hmm. a bit Mm -hmm. um and um like for me i'm I'm a pianist so like if i sit down on the piano i want to play something super easy it's always (laughs) gymnopedi if i need like classical music nerds are out there it's i will sit there i'm like i can play gymnopedi and for elise like with my eyes closed and like upside down with my fingers on the on the keys. So that would be a great like active recovery piece for me. So um, it's restful. Passive it's recovery actually... is what was that? Oh, I'm just saying it sounds like restful practice. Like it's not it's not yeah. arduous. Yeah, but you're still playing. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. You're also. still playing. It's just like yeah, I can do that, no problem. Mm-hmm. Um, pa- a passive recovery can look like I'm going to organize the corner of all my music stuff. I'm going to listen to other musicians playing the stuff that I'm trying to learn. You know, things where you can still be active in building your musicality, but you are not physically doing the task of playing the instrument. Right, right. Or just or just not think about music too, right? I mean, you're still recovering. If oh, you're, 100%. Yeah, right. Just actually resting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, uh, all of us like uh, ambitious, you know, musicians. We're trying to always work on stuff. I mean, that's how that's how I am too. But um, yeah, the two things with the with the passive things to do. I already mentioned it. You're working on stuff that doesn't use your your hand that has an issue or whatever. Mental. You kind of mentioned it like somewhere, but mental practice is amazingly beneficial. Mm-hmm. Mental practice. Imagining for me, for me, imagining the fretboard, trying to hear it. Pl- playing through things that I know I can play, but only in my mind, um, is actually incredible practice. Something I'll talk more about on the channel um, in the future. And then one of these silver linings for me that I didn't mention, but um, having issues uh, forced me to, to, I now have a technique that is extremely light. Like, and I wouldn't have if mm-hmm. I did, because because a big part of the issue we get, whatever it is for guitars, it's usually from gripping too hard. That's a big thing on the guitar at least that's going to cause whatever it is thumb wrist uh forearm um and so i was forced to learn through my recovery how to play as light as possible and now i play that way and it's a huge huge uh, benefit to my playing but one more comment about the um active recovery which which is like that restful practice um i wasn't even thinking of it this way, but when I was working on some really heavy chord melody stuff, and I teach teach a lot of chord melody on my channel and have a course on it and stuff like that, um, when I was really like drilling, drilling, drilling through things, I would tune the guitar down a whole fourth and all the strings down. So yeah, they're all buzzy and floppy, but um, but I can get all my practice in, and it sounds still sounds cool and sounds great. Like you're hearing the harmony and stuff, but it was insanely easy to play. Like you you just didn't even there was no tension to the strings. You know, um, and so a little hack, a little hack that I've used when I, if you do have to, and maybe you can do this if you're like not practicing much and then you suddenly have the big burst of practicing, like you have a gig, like Abby was talking about, um, tune your strings way down and, and shed, I think you get more mileage out of it and less, you know, less physical strain by tuning way down. Um, anyway, I found that to work a little hack. That's kind of cool. 
Um, I love it. And um, oh, there's one other thing I was going to say. I can't remember. But uh, hmm. but uh, w- were you going to go on with that or should we move on to? We have a lot to cover, so we'll move on to. Yeah. Actually, I do have one more important thing. Please. Um, if If you are in a season of life where you have to practice often, 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 and I'm thinking like those like freshman in music school college years right where it's all of a sudden you've like leveled up your game and now you have to practice a ton schedule your recovery time first and Mm. then fill in the rest afterward um and it kind of gives you the mental uh what's the word like you're prioritizing your recovery first um because if you can get your recovery in before you physically need it you're going to be able to go for much longer. Your body is going to tell you when you need recovery time, whether you mentally want it or not. And you'd le- I would like you to get a jump start on it <laughs> before it tells you in the worst way. <laughs> this is this is great. Uh, the idea that um, because I think up till now it could still be perceived that recovery is once you have an issue, but recovery mm. is also when you're not. You, recovery is just means you need to give your body a break. You know, even if you're not having it, everything's going fine. You're as healthy as can be. Recovery is still the time that you're not playing. Like just so, like you said, that the exercising, um, it doesn't mean you have a problem that you have to recover. You're supposed to, you know, supposed to recover. And I would say mentally too, because I, you know, I talk a lot about deliberate practice and really serious, focused, effective, organized practice and, and what that means. And it's, it's absolutely exhausting. Like truly the best type of practice for actual improvement is mentally so insanely straining um and you know to the point of like you got to take a nap after it and that's like the recovery like your brain has just like been forcing new neural pathways to happen and so physically Mm. yeah physically the same thing so um and then i would say when i see people practicing suddenly a lot more it's when it's when they retire uh because there's a a lot of people like oh i'm gonna and and i get you know a lot of messages comments emails and stuff like that and people in my courses and it makes sense you know like retire retirement's around the corner for someone and they love playing guitar it's like i'm gonna ramp it up you know i can't wait for that and so maybe according to abby's advice here like ideally am i right that maybe one would staircase that upwards a little bit instead of day one (laughs) Yeah, yes. Slowly. And it's just like if you were building a running plan for running a marathon, you know, you would mentally say, okay, Tuesdays and Sundays are going to be my off days. You know, you plan for that. Saturday is going to be my yeah. long run day. The same yeah. principles that we use in athletics apply to music. Um, yeah. So if you can sprinkle in that, that intentional recovery time kind of constantly, yeah. Um, then they are going to be less likely to be in a scenario where your arms are the ones telling you like you have to take two weeks off now you know if you yes. can if you can get ahead of it that would be that's going to set yourself up for success you know it's like the epidemic of burnout right now it's like yes if and and i'm susceptible to this because i like to work <laughs> and I, I like <laughs> to do things and it's just enjoyable for me but you know if i don't take a day off then I feel like the day takes me off, you know, like it eventually, Mm. it eventually does it to me because it's just like, I'm forced (laughs) to, uh, instead of like, you say being on top of it, like take the weekend, you know, or whatever it is, whatever it is for, for, for any individual. Um, so practice, uh, you know, breaks, uh, how long in a session, is there any kind of universal advice around breaks you know recovery yes rest yes plan your recovery time how much you get but like you know would you say someone shouldn't sit and practice for two hour two hours straight without stopping you know is there like or or is it just completely depend i mean i do it depends on what's normal for you um yeah i would say if you're used to two-hour practices, do two-hour practices. Then it's fine. Uh, if yeah. you're not, start with one hour and work your way up. <laughs> yeah. um, I generally recommend chunks of time of 15 to 30 minutes. You know, if yeah. you're making a bigger jump than that, then over time that you could pay for it. If it's like a one-off day and you're like, I have the day off, I'm going to have fun today, 
great. You know, like it means day off of work. I can play the guitar a lot. You know, great. That's going to be a fun day. It's going to be fine. We are not fragile. We are, we will be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you all of a sudden jump from 30 minutes to four hours and you do that for eight days straight, that's where you're going to get yourself into trouble. So practice timeline or time, uh, like volume wise in the day is widely variable from person yeah. to person. It's just, have you given yourself the chance to adapt to what you want to be able yeah. to do? Um, is the big thing. I what's usually your, recommend at least level? one day a week of like passive recovery. Yeah. Um, right. And and that's why I say like schedule that first. Like look yeah. at your week and say like, oh, I'm going to a wedding on Saturday. Right. I'm not going to play the guitar. And then you can, you know, just mentally have that already in your mind and yeah. play around that. It seems like probably the, the most core skill possible in this in this realm that we're talking about is just an extreme awareness of the body. You know, I think mm. you know, from my experience anyway, I find it easy to, and I think it's pretty common to, to n- not hear the canary in the coal mine, right? Not, not get the very, very first signals of what your body's telling you. You wait until it's more like a fire alarm uh, instead, you know, when really you could have an awareness of your body and, um, maybe know when it's time to take a break because of that. Um, I don't know, just a thought. And um, the, yeah, it's hard to keep track of all, all the things I want to say and they'll come back to me as we get done. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we've kind of covered like general preventative, like all guitarists uh, for, for anyone not having an issue yet, like preventative uh, stuff, mm. just the overall, but is there anything additional preventatively that we should all be aware of say someone's not having an issue yet or wants to prevent it in the future again in any way at all including potential you know physical things which i'm guessing maybe general exercise and nutrition and stuff are part of too you know yeah um i think that it's basically like be it be a good human (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think having a part of most days where you get out of your brain and into your body is really helpful. It helps with that kind of awareness that you were just talking about. Um, For me, that looks like weightlifting. For somebody else, it might be running or dancing, whatever. Um, Hula hooping. Something where you're doing some kind of variable movement where you can basically build a resilient body that can deal with most things. Um, Yeah. And enjoyment is key. So, don't punish yourself with something that you hate. Pick an activity that you like. Um, and, you know, maybe it's a way to connect with your friend group or your family or, you know, there's some, there's a lot of other pros that go with that. Um, but get into your body and move it <laughs> in whatever yeah. way that feels best. Um, building resilience is key. And um, that way, that way you kind of build resilience for your playing as well. Um, and it keeps your body really um, dynamic, you know, playing the guitar puts you in a certain body position. It just does just like playing golf does and playing the flute, like everything has positions or movements that are repetitive. There's no activity out there. That's like, has every single thing well-rounded. Um, but if you can also have these other movements in your life, then it doesn't, you know, you don't have to look like you're playing the guitar all day, every day. Yeah. You can be moving in other ways. Um, and, and for those of us and, one track, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 go for it. Oh, I was just going to say, for those of us one track mind people, you know, it's like it, uh, it, you can think, oh, this, you know, this other thing I'm doing is, is also good for me as a musician or as a, as a guitarist because you need that. You need that. You can't really be a one-dimensional person, and and uh, most people aren't. But you know, I have that kind of no. obsession in me. But uh, in it, in my resting state, this shoulder kind of goes up. Like this is an exaggerated yeah. version of it, and it is bonkers. And I think you even pointed this out to me originally. You're like, stand there, just stand, you know, f- relaxed and straight. And and I'm like, I'm like, and you're like, uh huh your shoulder and, and so now it's just the weird you know i'll be laying in bed and i'll notice this is up like this i'm like okay go down or drink a glass of water and it's like why is you know my shoulder up like that and it's that that guitar playing position you know having yeah. things conditioned in a different way it's an awkward inst- i mean a lot of instruments are awkward but it's an awkward physical thing to do yeah 
Yeah. Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with like having movement tendencies. We all are going to have them. The trouble usually comes when we can't get out of them or we don't like have the choice. Like you have the choice to put your shoulder back down, which mm. means you're mm-hmm. way less likely to have an, an issue with it. Mm-hmm. Somebody mm-hmm. who like literally doesn't know that their shoulder is up or can't physically put it back down is they're more likely to have some type of discomfort um, associated with that particular body position or movement. Um, so being like variable in the types of movements and having choice in what your body can do in terms of movement is, is huge in terms of preventing like overuse, repetitive style injuries. Um, and then the second thing that I find myself talking about in terms of preventing (laughs) injuries often is, and this includes what you hear from me, whatever advice you hear. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> mm, I love this <laughs> about posture or movement or breathing or whatever. Take only what you need. Um, there are so many musicians who are just so dang coachable that they'll do everything 110. Yeah. yeah. Um, like what I'm I'm thinking of like the classic like chin tuck. People are you know wanting to like not have their head move forward, so they're like oh, I'm going to do a chin tuck. You can mm. even hear how my voice changes when I do that. Mm -hmm. Um, It has an impact on us and we don't need to do it 100% of the time. You just need to not only be able to go head forward. Um, So those style advice things you hear on TikTok, you know, like do a chin tuck or whatever, like put your shoulders down and back. Okay, that can be good for somebody. It may or may not be you. And 100% of the time is not the answer. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, this is probably the number one takeaway that I got from you over time um, and you know, probably something we should have even put earlier in the conversation. <laughs> but it's uh, the you know dynamic posture, sitting position angle that there's not one right way. And it makes so much sense when you think about it, because even if you lay in bed in the comfiest position in the world, it's not going to be so comfy after whatever amount of time right so if you're playing with proper technique and you're not letting yourself ever you know being rigid with not letting yourself ever shift in any way then um that will possibly become uncomfortable or problematic right this is the kind of the takeaway i got from you and it's very effective i'd say probably is contributing to my you know contributed to my recovery and my comfort level now because um Mm. you know i tend to sit with the guitar angled in the classical position and on my videos i have i have a camera right here that's at that angle so you see the guitar like this and it looks like i'm like about i'm like i'm leaning also and it's funny (laughs) but uh and people comment on it like why does this guitar teacher look like he's about to fall over but um (laughs) but you know for for playing because uh that's just what gives me the best kind of angle and reach for for what i'm used to but if i'm really sitting through a practice session, I actually shift a lot here and there, you know, I'll shift it to the other leg, I'll shift, you know, change around a little bit, uh, have different support things like the cushion or the footstool or whatever. Um, And I've been teaching now for a while that people can really find what's like, you can't, no one can argue with what your body is telling you feels great. And that's why that body awareness is so important, right? Like, are you having issues? Are you having tension? Are you having pain? If not, why would why would there be a better way, right? Until like, oh, I actually need this for this reach, right? Unless there's a real reason for it. Um, yeah, so I love that. And, and as far as the advice thing, um, I have the exact same opinion, you know, as someone who's sharing, uh, who's literally teaching online all the time. Um, I don't, yeah, we should, we got to be careful when we just hear someone say something and believe that it is that because we heard it, right? Or, um, yeah, just like, just because someone said it doesn't mean it's true or mean it mean it's right for you or, or whatever. And it's like, people get frustrated with all the different teachers contradicting each other online. Well, that's a sign that there's, there's not one right way. And, and one teacher, I try to be clear about this in my teaching, like, Hey, this is just my opinion, or this is just what worked for me. So I'm sharing it with you in case it helps you. Right. I try to say that as often as possible, but, um, yeah, taking everything with a grain of salt and and not just being like, ah, the absolute only thing, you know, the only answer, whether it's physical, whether it's musical, whatever. Yeah. 
Yeah. I um, find myself talking about posture now as a means of communication rather than a means of right and wrong. Um, so if you are playing something that's more like assertive, aggressive, or, you know, kind of a, I don't know what, an extroverty kind of message, then you might want your chest up and to be a little bit more on the balls of your feet and, um, you know, a little more like Prince Charming um, type posture. Yeah. If you're playing something a little more like vulnerable, tender, then you might be mm. more on your heels. You might be on the backs of your sit bones. Your chest mm -hmm. might be kind of down. All of that's right. It, and it would look really odd if you were doing something that you felt was correct, but was like the antithesis of the message you were trying to convey. It, it would be unsuccessful for your audience. Um, yeah. And so being able to play in all of the positions and play well in all of them <laughs> will help you to, you know, yeah. convey what you want to convey with your music. Yeah. Two, so I had two, well, I had three main classical guitar professors uh, when I was really studying classical guitar really heavily. Two of them, one of them was, they're all, all amazing players. One of them would play like hunched over the guitar like this <laughs> and, and just staring at his hand, like, you know, things that maybe a beginner might say. A lot of beginners are like, oh, I need to work on not looking at my hand why you know like if you really if you want to for a reason fine you know maybe how it looks yep. but it's you're, yep. you're playing music you don't need you can look at your hand if you want to it's fine and the, you know so this professor he's like hunched over and playing this way another classical guitar professor of mine much more kind of prim and proper approach but he would intentionally practice slouched on the couch uh, as a variety as a one of his you know variations of sitting so you know real practice but like okay he does a lot of concerts he has to practice a lot like uh, I need to just slouch back and play now. And I love doing that too. I love a good play mm -hmm. guitar playing session where, it's, uh, you know, evening style playing is very different than morning, morning, like even just the sitting and the posture and everything. Yeah. 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 And, and one thing to add to this here, since we're talking about physical positions and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, you know, the wrist, we're going to, we're going to go through specific symptoms that are very common here soon. And the wrist, wrist pain from guitar playing is the number one. Um, mm -hmm. for me personally, I'm still working on it, but trying to keep my wrists as straight as possible when I'm playing has been, uh, has been really helpful. I used to play intentionally with it arched, which is like, why? I thought, oh, I'm giving space to the fingers and the strings and stuff like that. Now I'll arch it mm. when I need to, which is here and there. It's very fluid. It kind of, it goes, um, you know, arch when it needs to move back. It's not rigid at all. Right. I think it it not being rigid is probably the most important thing but you know mm -hmm. here we are saying don't believe all advice and and you know anything is fine if you're comfortable and and i agree with that but for me this pretty much within like a minute of playing arch like that i feel i feel issues you know i feel it yeah. not good and so that's that awareness thing and maybe for some people that's not a problem but keeping my wrist straight um has been important for me which like physically doesn't that just make all kinds of sense? Like to not, oh, 100%. <laughs> like what kind yeah. of mobility so, do you have? Yeah. I'm like, do you want the science behind this? Because anything, my brain wants to give you the science, you got. science yeah. behind it. Yeah. Um, yeah. For all muscles, like the middle range of their range. <laughs> um, so let's take the biceps because everybody kind of knows where their biceps are in the front of your upper arm, right? If it's, if your elbow's all the way bent and your hand is like on your shoulder, if you try to contract your biceps, it's not super powerful. If you're all the way out straight, your elbow's straight, and you try to contract your bi biceps muscle, it's not very powerful. If you put mm. it halfway, you can get some oomph. You, that's where you mm. would carry a heavy box is with your elbow bent halfway. Mm. Um, and the same is true of our wrist and forearm muscles. So if you have your wrist um, bent or flexed the way that Jared was talking about, and you try to be really quick with your fingers, those muscles on the top of your forearm are stretched the most and the muscles on the like front or uh, the palm side of your forearm are on slack the most. So neither set of those muscles are in their best, most powerful, most agile position. And the same would be true if you extended your wrist the other way, like, you know, you know, bent, bent your fingers back towards your the, the top of your forearm um, in, in the inverse. So keeping it somewhere in the middle is where you're going to find the, the maximal amount of like oomphy, happy muscle contraction. Um, what you don't want to do is feel is hear that and then go, I have to keep it neutral 100% of the time, because that again yeah. is the same 
issue where you are now just living yep. in the same position the whole time and it's going to get oversensitized. So rigidity is the enemy, but somewhere floaty in the middle of the two extremes is a happy place. And it needs to be fluid to play well. Like it needs to be mm -hmm. very ready to move this way, this way, this way, this way for quick changes for chord shapes, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and again, for me, the, the default when po basically some stuff I can play keeping it straight and I'll have it art. I, there's room to like, oh, I should when possible, you know, move that straight a little bit, but you know, and if we sound like we're contradicting ourselves a little bit by saying, you know, there's no one way and then you can do anything you want, then it, it, it really is about that body awareness in the end. Right. Because mm -hmm. if you're, cause like who, if someone's wrist is very arched and they're playing concerts and feeling great and not having issues for 30 years, like, yeah. Who are we to say any you know anything totally. at all? Totally, you've adapted just, to that position. Well yeah, done. Yeah, and you're strong on. enough. And like you know, but there are physical limitations. Like there, it's cool to hear you know your actual anatomy knowledge of things too, because it's like, yeah, do anything you want that as long as you're feeling okay. But there's also like physical advantages to certain things. Like you will have a stronger, you will have more f mobility in your fingers if your wrist is straight. So yeah, right. Um, yep. So we've talked before about, uh, we've probably covered this already, but I, I've asked you in the past, you know, what what's something that brand new guitarists should watch out for? And I'll just recap your past answer. And if you have anything oh, else yeah, or not, then, um, then say whatever you want. But I loved your answer, which was just that they get too excited. Like, the, which, is <laughs> which is really what you already said, right? Watch out for, yeah. like, you know, you're excited about guitar and you haven't played it at all and you're about to start and and uh you just go at it too hard you know and again we've already said yeah. this but yeah and i i have a beginner course and abby did a, a did a video with me in the beginner course that we talked about some stuff for for beginners so i wanted to bring up this because i loved that answer just kidding yeah i think <laughs> getting the in. answer is the same yeah i think also like be excited play too much and yeah. expect to maybe hurt a little <laughs> yeah and recover you know have that recovery yeah 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 well um yeah that's great i just wanted to i just love it, getting excited it is in the end all of this that ambitious it is kind of from unless you're on pre have pressure for something external like a gig like we talked about it's a lot of times from just being excited. And I'd say that's what happened to me too. You know, I can show up and practice and just get in the zone and want, not want to stop. And then that could, I could pay the price later, you know. Um, anything about breathing that we, you and I haven't talked about this before, but like wh where does breathing come into play with instrumentalists, with guitarists, with recovery, with technique? Um, anything yeah. at all you know i talk about it sometimes in my lessons because when i warm up i take and it's just a habit now i don't think about it but i take big deep breaths while doing my my uh, warm-up exercise uh mm -hmm. which is a warm-up that i do every time i play and um there's i have a link in the description where you can get the pdf of that warm-up but i do big deep breaths while i do that i should put it in the sheet music It'd be like take a <laughs> take a big deep breath, uh, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, any you know from yeah from you yeah right yeah, <laughs> showing the notation of the breaths. Um, so yeah, well, how does this come into play when you're working with with clients or just what you've seen? Yeah, I think uh, I can take this kind of three different categories. The first one is often guitarists are also singers, um, mm -hmm. and so to be able to breathe and play means you can sing and play. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. and I actually discovered this about myself. I often play the piano and sing and, um, I find myself holding my breath while I'm playing the piano. And then mm -hmm. if I'm singing and playing the piano, I actually play better. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I'm moving air. Um, but, uh, making sure that you have the ability to like maintain a normal amount of air going in and out while you play. And you're not creating a sense of like stability or holding by breath holding while you play, mm -hmm. um, is going to help if you also want to be able to sing while you play. Um, the next one is thinking about breath in more of like a rib cage mobility. Why this is like going into the PT side of my brain, but, um, it. as guitarists, you will, until there's like somehow a left-handed guitar. Does that exist? A left-handed guitar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It does. Um, okay. Well, play. if there's some, if there's some it, magical way to switch sides. Yeah, um, yeah. No, there's a left. I mean, Paul McCartney played left-handed. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. Um, but Jimi typically, Hendrix, I think, too. Um, the right side of the ribs are going to be more compressed, and the left side of the ribs are going to be more open and like elevated. Which, in terms of what your diaphragm and your breathing muscles think that means, is your left side is better at inhaling and your right side is better at exhaling. There's nothing wrong with that until you get stuck like that, just like we've talked about a thousand times already today. Um, but we can use breathing to make sure that that either doesn't happen or if that has kind of that pattern has started to like coil up on you or what's the word like you, know, you kind of screw yourself into that position um we can use breathing to get you out of it where you work on inhaling in a position where you would be in inhale on the right and exhaling on the left so you're kind of doing the opposite of what the guitar naturally makes you do and then breathing in that position yeah and then that's the where you third, get it to some, um, yeah go ahead the third kind of way that breath feels important is we can manipulate our like fight or flight rest and digest systems with breathing, which is important for just like performance anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. A nice long mm -hmm. exhale is going to dial up the rest and digest half of our nervous system. Um, and a big inhale is going to dial up our fight or flight. So if you're about to go out on stage and you're like, well, I can feel those butterflies, the longest exhale that you have nice long i mean 8 12 15 count exhale <laughs> mm. um until you are empty and then kind of a hold on that exhale and then nice and easy breathe in so you can crank up the volume of rest digest i'm calm i'm okay mm. um fight or flight is important especially while performing you get that like adrenaline rush you get out there and you're like i have all the energy even if yeah. i don't um so there's nothing wrong with some fight or flight but if you're struggling with some anxiety you can kind of manipulate that feeling just with, through breath. Oh, beautiful. And, and, and since tension is kind of the ultimate enemy, this nervous system response of breathing uh, will help us not, <laughs> not use the adrenaline to like squeeze too hard and have all the rigidity and the tension and everything like that. Absolutely. And yeah. Um, yeah. Breathing is, is incredible. It's, um, I was just reading a, a very well-known book about basically about overall about trauma. Uh, the body keeps the score. Mm. Uh, oh, you, know, yeah. you know the Classic. book? Yeah. It, it's so, such a powerful book. So good. And just learning about the different, you know, areas of the brain giving signals to the emotional uh, piece of the brain, which, you know, don't quiz me on this, the amygdala, I think. Um, but that your brain stem, like your lizard brain or whatever, your limbic system will give you responses to the amygdala, your emotional part of the brain, faster than your prefrontal cortex, your conscious thinking part can give signals to that amygdala. So your emotional response, you know, stress, uh, tension, trauma, physical anxiety is happening before you are even aware of, you know, how to think about it or how to read. You don't stand a chance, basically. You don't stand a chance thinking your way, you know, responding to that and try. So think as much as, you know, positive psychology can be effective or, or cognitive behavioral therapy and stuff. So anyway, long way of getting back around to saying the, that breathing is the way to calm your nervous system outside of, you know, trying to think that it actually will calm the limbic system, you know, core, core, core part of your brain, sending a signal back up to your emotions saying like, everything's a little bit okay. Right. It's a little bit. And, and just reading about that was incredible. And, um, like I said, I do breathing when I, when I do warm ups, but I've also been doing, um, like a box breathing technique in the mm -hmm. mornings. That's like, Kind of like what you're talking about, but I'll breathe super slow four count in, hold for the same count, out for the same count, hold for the same count around, and it like calms me down. I mean, you know, like the rest it. of the human race, uh, I've been uh, a little more anxious since COVID and, you know, just, and, and I never used to have per ever performance issues. I always have been, I always loved getting on stage. I performed a bunch in super high pressure situations, but it's only recently. And I don't know if it's just getting older and, you know, being more aware of risk more and taking, aware. you know, That's what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> having more awareness of like, this is a little intense. And before just barreling through life experiences yes. and like, I've had, you know, some on edge kind of panic feelings that I never, never used to have. So that breathing 
you know, helps a lot. But back to the guitar playing, you know, if we can relax our bodies, that's when we actually give the body a chance to heal, right? Because how's it going to heal if it's, if you're in the fight or flight, like fight, flight, freeze. Yep. The, it's going to not be taking care of the, the healing. You can't be aware of what you're feeling if you're fighting, fighting. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad I asked. Yeah. Breathing is, breathing is, is a big one. Um, So the last thing I want to say before we go through symptoms Mm -hmm. And we don't have to, you know, I know this is a long conversation, but I, I think we just kind of roll through all of it and just just have it have it available to people. The next thing we're going to cover yeah. is symptoms, wrist pain, tendonitis, arthritis, shoulder pain, thumb pain, back pain, elbow pain, forearm pain, tingling, hands falling asleep, because these are the kinds of things that actually Abby will treat, right? Like, what do you do? And we can, we can, you know, we don't need to draw it out too long, but we whatever your answers are for those things... We, these are things people are looking for answers for. So we're going to do that. But mm-hmm. before that, I just want to say my last thing is, is the importance of warming up, which I already, which I already said. And I talk mm-hmm. about all the time. Um, my experience is that, um, well, I used to just jump into playing, you know, just, oh, just going to start playing whatever the hard thing I'm working on, uh, whatever, whatever I'm deep into working on regularly, I would just jump in and start practicing. Um, and you know, my recovery experience from after having the issue, I, tr- I tried everything I could, you know, got a lot of help. And I've already mentioned a few things that have helped me, but warming up is like a non-negotiable now. And it doesn't take mm. long. I'll do five minutes to, to up to 10 minutes, five, five minutes sometimes can do it. Cause I just have a specific warm up that I do, um, at the minimum. And I'll sometimes do a little more. And it's just this physical thing that does all my finger combinations on each string. Um, and anyway, I haven't had issues since, uh, you know, it's not the most scientific approach because it's not like I tested what gives the most impact to my recovery and my preventative, mm. you know, and, and now I can play as much as I want, but warming up is just so important. So I just wanted to throw that at the end for all of us, you know, and again, if you want the PDF of the exact warm up that I do every time I play, it's in the dis- link in the description on YouTube, or you can go to soundguitarlessons.com slash warm up, all one word warm up, and just get a PDF of that with tabs um, and notation. Um, let's go into wrist pain what do what do we do ouch what do we do i yeah, yeah. Like, and and i i had i've had almost all of these that we're gonna go through so <laughs> you know so you know now we're going into cl- client mode you know client comes to you with the guitarist a guitarist is having guitar wrist pain yeah well, I think, first of all, I think you're all going to hear me. You can almost like copy paste for most of these symptoms. So just like a heads up that you're going to hear some of the same That's stuff good. over and over again. Okay. Um, wrist pain is often a load management problem, meaning either too much playing, too little playing, um, or a type of playing or a position of playing that you're loading up the wrist and don't have other options. Like we've talked about postural issues and positional issues at nauseum earlier today. Um, so kind of problem solving, like what can we change to change the load on the wrist while you're playing either in volume or style or what position you're in. Um, and then often there's something I would say up the chain. That's what PTs would say. Um, that's leading to it. So for example, if somebody is, um, often in a position where their shoulder is rotated in, then their wrist may have to rotate out so that they can maintain a nice neutral hand position. Um, so there's some somewhere else that's making the wrist do something funky and then therefore create more load on the wrist itself. So that's where some of that like PT problem solving stuff comes up. Like, okay, let's see how your shoulder, how's your neck, what are your ribs doing? Something mm-hmm. else in the chain of, of movement that would be compromising the ease of your wrist mo- motion while you're playing the wrist is overcompensating taking on more work than it needs to because something else yes. is yeah needs, and that that's work what needs it needs to be redistributed i'm telling you the weirdest thing in the world my l- lower back on my right side <laughs> what the heck you know and then and then it's it's the chain of command yeah. right going through uh, yeah. connect you just gotta check everything's all the connected things, anything just like else they making told the us. wrist to work too hard just like they told us with that song, right? The, whatever. Yes. The wrist bones connected. To, yeah. Head, so shoulders, it's knees, all and toes. Conne- yeah. Yeah. All connected. So, yeah. So, load 
whatever you called it, what load, what kind of load? And energy load, load management. Load management. Yeah, makes perfect sense. And I love that because you can even just logically think, what's the che- list of check boxes that I can look through to just uh, lighten the load on the wrist, right? So the yeah. angle for me was a big one. I talked about playing way lighter and not not pushing down as hard, which is you know a big one. My shoulder not being up for me is a big one. Not staying too much in the same position for too long, and and you know et cetera et cetera. Now of course we're talking yeah. about now uh, a preventative as well. But are there things you know if someone really comes to you with this problem, do you also give them stuff to do? Now disclaimer here: we're not giving you stuff to do. You got to, mm. you know, if you're having a problem, don't you go see, go see a specialist. You know, this is yes. m- maybe informative and helpful Education for you, purposes only. Yeah, don't, don't <laughs> sue me. Basically, don't sue me. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've, I've said the thing I need to say. So, yeah. Do you give them things to actually do? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and those. If grip strength is weak or, uh, you know, um, shoulder motion in one direction is weaker than the other, you know, the things will, will kind of like balance things out. Um, honestly, the best thing you can do for like building solid wrists is weightlifting. Okay. Pick up heavy stuff and move heavy things um, and pick them up in weird ways, you know, barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells with the thing on the back of the hand instead of the front, yeah. you know, like it's um, make yourself strong in every direction and you're less likely to run into an issue. Amazing. And I, I could see that being the answer to everything too, right? Like my tendonitis. Yeah, so I was, like copy I was paste, never, copy. you know, <laughs> I tried to stay healthy over time, but I never did weightlifting. And, and at that, I do a little bit of it now. And also that probably contributes to, to just my, my, my better arm situation than I had before. You yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so yeah. So as far as specific things to do, that's pretty important that you get someone to look at your specific situation. That's why we're not going right. to say, do this, yeah. do this, do this. But there are things you can do, and yeah, et cetera. Let's move on to tendonitis. Totally fine. If a lot of the answer is the same, we can kind of whip through yeah. this again, this again, this again, and we'll, and we'll just get through these symptoms in this way. Yeah. Uh, tendonitis is often the same as wrist pain, but sometimes we need to play with overloading and underloading on purpose. Um, to make your tendons start to adapt to what you want them to be able to do. Um, so that's one that's a, um, often a little bit more like exercise heavy. Um, mm. And at the same time, trying to do the problem solving that we've talked about to keep you playing because tendonitis is one of those like ugh, sticklers. It just hangs around for a while. It absolutely heals. It just takes a while. Um, and so that's, that's a big one for how do we keep you playing while assigning exercises that will either overload the tissues or underload them depending on your specific needs. Can you explain what it is? So this is what I had here. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just explain what's going on there. Yeah. So and, and I agree that it took, it, it was a long t- term issue. Like, like you said, it was didn't go away. Yeah. But go ahead. Yeah. It just yeah. took a long time. So right? yeah. tendonitis technically is just swelling of a tendon and a tendon is what connects a muscle to a bone. Um, so it's often up at the elbow or down at the wrist. Um, this is also the same as like Achilles tendonitis. Like, you know, people can get it anywhere a tendon exists. Um, and, um, but most of the time, by the time somebody is ready to complain about it or they go see somebody, it's technically in the tendinosis stage, um, where the tendon is not just plain swollen anymore. It is also super sensitized from a nervous mm. system standpoint. And that's what takes a while to change. We were talking about changing like the alert button, um, earlier and the, and tendinosis or, or ongoing intermittent chronic tendonitis um, is something where we need to basically train your nervous system to not alert every time you do something that could be sensitive to the tendon. Um, and, and that's usually the, the time consuming thing. And that's why sometimes we need to overload the tissues on purpose and then recalibrate to that. Um, so that's, that's a good one to have a, have a PT on hand for. Right. But good to hear those details, right? So if someone's really struggling with it long term, it's normal that it takes a while to go, that it's a yes. kind of a pest that doesn't go away easily. And yeah. yeah. So inflammation, yeah. is that the right word? You didn't say yeah, that, but yeah. is that the right word? swelling. Okay. Yeah, swelling. And it's not that they're, it's like torn. Is it also that it's like torn? I don't know why I had that in my no, mind. No, not necessarily. Okay. I kind of thought it was like, 
the tendons were ripped or something like that. But no, it's just a swell. Yeah, so inflammation, interesting. Well, so I would, let me, let me ask you about this. So I would do this yeah. thing, which is like the most practical kind of stretch, you know, pull on this, stretch like this. Yeah. Um, when I had my arm issues thinking, you know, I got to do that. And, and I, I, I believe I did it way too much and it was mm. causing the problem to be much worse. And it didn't occur to me till months and months later to, as I'm trying everything to stop that. And um, stopping doing that actually was the turning point that started more healing happening, that I wasn't just like pulling on this. Is that, you know, does that make sense? It's a little bit in line with what we're saying. Like, don't just do something someone says, don't, you know, be dynamic and don't, you know, don't, nothing is the ultimate only way to do something. Like, I just was like, you know what, I'm going to stop stretching this way. The thing that seems like we should do, I'm just going to stop it and do all the other things. And it got started getting better. So does it make sense that I was causing it to flare yeah. up? I mean, if you take like kind of like a bruised swollen thing and you pull on it, it probably is not going to feel so good. <laughs> Man, so obvious. So obvious. Why? Yeah. So why is that such the like, oh, you got to, you know, why is that? It's, it, I mean, it, gosh, it's like it, you feel like so it's tight or something. Sometimes stretching like, like that can help because what you're doing is you're putting a tensile load on the tissue and you're changing its position and getting it out of whatever the position that's been sensitized, meaning it gives you giving you yeah. a lot of alerts. Yeah. Um, and so for somebody that probably works great. It will probably work somewhat immediately or at least in a few days if it's going to work. Yeah, no, I'm like that. It's like that joke where the guy's like, hey, doctor, it hurts when I do this and they hit their head with a hammer. It's like, well, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> it's like, what? what? <laughs> of course it does. Everybody's <laughs> like that, though. I can't yeah. tell you how many times I've had clients come in and they're like, yeah, like, you know, my feet hurt when I run. These shoes aren't comfortable. And I'm like, why are you wearing these shoes? Yeah. Like, I don't know. The guy at the store told me to get them. And I'm like, exactly. yeah. why are right. you listening to the guy at the store more than you're listening to yourself? If Your the body, shoes aren't yeah. comfortable, ditch the shoes. This is a, another reminder for all of us. Uh Listen to yourself, listen to your body, yeah, test. You know best. Uh, and just don't take someone's advice, me included, Abby included, and think, I got to only do this. This is the way, you know. Yeah. yeah totally important. Yeah. Okay, let's move on yeah. to a big one, arthritis. Uh, different, different than these others, right? Because it can yeah. be a ch chronic thing. You can not, it's not anyone's fault, you know, that's happening. It's not an injury. It's different than that. Can you explain what it is and then and then what, you know, I don't know, whatever treatment, preventative management, I guess would be the right word, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, arthritis is essentially inflammation of a joint. Arth Arthur is the, um, you know, little bit of the medical terminology is, means joint and itis means inflammation. Um, so there are many way, many reasons for why a joint might be swollen. Um, and there are things like autoimmune issues like rheumatoid arthritis, which is more of a condition that you have come by either by chance or genetically, um, where your body is going, I'm going to inflame these joints now, and you're going to have to hear about it. Um, there are plenty of things that you can do to help manage that, get a solid um, rheumatologist on your team um, to help you medically manage some of the discomfort you have. And um, the nice thing about something like that is instruments often help because you're keeping yeah. things moving. Um, and so if you, if that, that can be kind of the PT role in that circumstance where we can try to help you problem solve to keep you playing while you learn to medically manage some of the discomfort that you're having. There's also the more common version of arthritis, which is osteoarthritis, which is kind of what people have called the wear and tear, which I hate that term, but that's the mm. like general term for it. Mm. Um, where we have bony changes over time, meaning as we age, um, and the bony changes are normal. Every single human being who is a human will have bone change as they age. Not everybody ends up with the pain that we call arthritis. And so sometimes we can change the pain by changing the, this is going back to the load management topic, the load on those joints. Um, so either changing how, like what positions feel more accessible to you, um, 
changing the strings, changing Mm -hmm. the action. Like there's so many other things that we can do that will give your joints the ease that they need to be able to continue playing. Um, And arthritis often responds really well to big loads like barbell lifting, um, like, like gradually working up to being able to tolerate big loads actually makes you less likely to have pain with smaller loads, like playing the guitar. Is that like a load, uh, like, ah, what did you call it again? Load, uh, load management. It is management. I was almost going to say it. I felt like, um, I I was remembering it wrong. So load, is that kind of like a load management thing where you are strengthening your muscles in other areas so that the joint itself is not taking on the burden or not necessarily that what's going on? Yes. And um, teaching your body that it can withstand that load over okay. time. And so oh, that smaller yeah. loads are less likely to be like, this is a problem. Oh, um, yeah. But yes, so like building up like muscular stability as well as literally like turning the dial down on alerting you to a certain type or amount of stress. So with osteoarthritis, is it also the case that playing can be helpful? You said it specifically with yes. rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so with, in both cases, movement, motion, reg, you know, keeping it moving, keeping it fluid. Yes, as so long playing as you can have actually a be training very regimen that feels doable for you. Yeah, um, it doesn't it mean worse. more is better, but some is good. Right. Yeah. So I had a student that, um, said this to me in his first lesson a long time ago, like, oh yeah, my, my doctor said I should be playing guitar. You know, he, he was a guitarist, but he was, he yeah. was like, yeah, this is part of what I need to be doing this, you know, so the, I have arthritis and I need to be moving my fingers. I find that very reassuring and comforting since it's so common that we age and in, in, that so many of us have this, have this problem that the, thankfully the answer that it's part of, part of the answer that it could be helpful to keep your joints moving and to keep playing guitar. And yeah, we yeah. might have to change, like you said, string gauge, tension, techniques, position, but you know, adapt in life as we all have to do always but um Mm -hmm. but it is nice to hear like okay this can be part of my my good things that i'm doing for it is playing yeah excellent um cool let's move on to shoulder pain i have not had this myself as a guitarist but a lot of students have had this um and of course i'm not a pt so i don't have professional advice to tell them outside of the guitar teacher part but Mm -hmm. um people tend to get a, a type of shoulder pain from playing from playing guitar and it, perhaps from reaching around an acoustic guitar is maybe what I sense yeah. and maybe that's why I've never had it because I play a lot of I play classical yeah. guitar a lot but I play this you know my telly which is very thin mostly so yeah, yeah. um yeah as I had said earlier muscles like to live in the middle of their range Mm-hmm. most of the time and they're they do better they do better work there um and guitar generally on the right requires shoulders to be at the end range of internal rotation where your hand is rotating down towards the floor um or in towards your belly if your elbow's hanging by your side um and on the left side it's the opposite where you are going up into external rotation like you're going to throw a ball um and they're kind of like close to the ends of those ranges of motion for however many minutes that you're playing. Um, and so that's generally a, a bigger load on those joints. It's not a reason to not play the guitar. <laughs> um, but um, being able to make sure that your shoulders are somewhat balanced and like the amounts of movement that they have in your everyday life is good. Um, making sure that the um, uh, areas kind of above and below them, meaning mostly like your shoulder blade and your rib cage, um, are nice and versatile and mobile and strong, um, sets them up for success. Um, and then the last piece is often um, a neck issue, um, things that have, and this is also true, we'll probably talk about hand, more hand pain again, but um, anything in your upper upper limbs, sometimes the pain can be stemming from actually a neck issue that's passing the message along through a nerve pathway to somewhere else, and the shoulder's a big one there. Yeah, I love all, all of your... Thank you for sharing all your knowledge and expertise with this. Um, as just the guitar player side of things, um, and, and you're kind of saying a lot about, yeah, middle range of, of the motion is, you know, healthier and stuff. Just imagine, you know, what it takes to, if you have a big dreadnought guitar or something, to hold your arm out and your shoulder forward and just doing it right now, uh, just kind of mimicking it even. It's like, wow, that feels really... Um, yeah 
not you know and not in strumming. its comfort zone and then in playing and strumming and doing it for hours or doing it every day right so little hack for guitarists that I also maybe have never had this problem because the proper guitar I never was much of a steel string acoustic player and but I've played a lot of classical guitar um, but the proper position for a classical guitar is because preamplification you're not supposed to touch the the back of the guitar to your body actually it should be mm -hmm. angled upward so the the corner of the bout of the guitar is touching your chest and then you have a corner touching one of your legs and then you have the middle bout that dips in on one of your other so there's only it's a triangle shape if you look at it from you know the side of someone sitting you'll see this triangle shape from the guitar to their body and it's angled upwards and anyway i'm just only concluding this now that i've never had this feeling of my arm and shoulder reaching around because the guitar facing upwards means that i don't have to reach around it yeah you know so, yeah. so it, you're not it, living as close to the edge of the range it brings the top of the guitar towards you and the bottom of the guitar away from you and you can very comfortably yeah not have to yeah do and so i play in that position so anyway uh if anyone's having shoulder strain a possible thing to to try as far as guitar sitting position so yeah. um a few more um thumb pain is very common now i have a crazy double <laughs> jointed <laughs> i have a double jointed hitchhiker thumb and this is another and i had thumb probably the first type of guitar pain i ever felt was in my teenage years playing in a rock band where there's a lot of power chords and, and movable chords and I was squeezing too hard because I didn't learn my good technique yet. Um, and my thumb, because I have this hitchhiker's thumb, it was just pushing on it and it would get f so fatigued. But people have a lot of thumb issues um, from, I'm mm -hmm. guessing, the pressure that treating the thumb as this thing that needs to, to create the pressure needed to push the strings down, which uh, I talk about all the time in my teaching when I talk about technique and in my beginner course and stuff like that, that we want to use our the weight of our arm a little bit to, to yeah. have the pressure for the fretboard. Uh, we actually want to ideally use as much of that as possible because you already have gravity. You, you can use gravity uh, for, you know, it can do the work for you instead of holding your arm up and maybe even your shoulder up and using all squeeze with your thumb to get the pressure you need. You can let go of that thumb pressure. I can do a full bar chord on any guitar, not just electric guitar, full bar chord without the thumb at all because of just the pullback of the gravity yeah. of the arm pressure. I show it to people sometimes and they think um, it, it's they think it's crazy because they are playing, you know, squeezing so much. But uh, but anyway, my long my long setup for that. What what do we got with thumb pain? That's the most common um uh, fix that I give people <laughs> mm. is make it a whole a whole arm um, responsibility instead of a thumb responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, I find that a lot of times thumb stuff is more more technique than other injuries are, mm. um, and so a lot of times I'm like, I need you to go get find a guitar teacher because um, yeah. that's not what I do. Um, there are obviously other variables that I can help people with, and it's usually like the stuff that we've talked about, like recovery. Um, volume of, of playing um, and that kind of stuff. And of course, I can give them those little nuggets of like redistribute the load to other parts of your body. Um, but a lot of times for things like thumbs, if we can't hit it with the, with kind of the general like kind of training um, yeah. rules, then I, I need them to go and like find somebody who's got some technique stuff for them. That makes so much sense because what kind of load is the thumb taking on that somewhere else could make up for it kind of it isn't a thing other than trying to use that gravity approach, which isn't really a part of your body. It's just a little sneaky, you know, you pull, using your arm. But yeah, side on that, if you are going to try that, just think of imagine your elbow having kind of a weight on it. And, and if your elbow had a weight on it and it was pulling more than it actually is, you know, what direction does that go? It's going to pull you towards the fretboard. And if you're playing with that angled up a little bit, like we just talked about, then you actually have um, towards the fretboard is slightly downward. So you're using gravity more than if your fretboard was exactly, um, mm. you know, perpendicular to the, to the floor and ceiling, then you, then you're pulling backwards instead of pulling downwards with gravity a little bit. Anyway, a little side. It is a guitar lesson channel, so we'll, we yeah. the, the guitar <laughs> the guitar tips mixed in. So I could do a whole video on on just that. So okay, a couple more, and then we'll wrap it up. But we might we've gone this long, and we might as well 
give <laughs> you know the full complete package here. So back pain. I'm I, I imagine um the physical fitness thing is a big one for this. The strength and weightlifting and probably flexibility. Yeah. But yeah. Definitely true. Back pain is um, often shows up in guitarists who um, are performing standing a lot. Oh, yes, 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 um, of course. Um, of the and there's a play. lot of people who are standing with their hips in front of their shoulders while they're playing because they're kind of like, they're like literally pushing their pelvis like into their instrument a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. also just the world of performing, you are standing for hours hours and of course you're like dancing around and having a good time but um it's a mm. long time to be standing if you are standing in that position so i also call it um museum walking where you like take a few steps and stand take a few steps and stand it that's like one of the most fatiguing things that we do as people oh, <laughs> um yeah and people so get that so shows tired up a lot at in... museums <laughs> yeah you exactly just walk into a museum yes. and say, Why so same so thing tired? as for gigging musicians like <laughs> yeah. all that standing um and so a lot of times i'm working with people to um strengthen muscles around their hips their hamstrings um make sure that they have lots of options for how to stand and so uh, you know it's 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 like how do we get through <laughs> basically um without fatiguing stuff in the back that's usually the issue um and then the other side of that is actually the going back to the breathing discussion um a lot of people breathe into the front of their rib cage and not the back of the rib cage we all know that we have ribs in the front but they do wrap around and attach to our spine in the back and so if we can't expand well into the back half of our body we end up in more of a compression through the back through our spines through our back um, and that gets quite tiring if you're sitting or standing for a long time. Um, and so a lot of times we'll do some breathing exercises where I put people in positions that are like the opposite of how they tend to play and make them breathe and expand into the back half of their rib cage. So I'm thinking like, um, like cat cow, but only the cat side where you're getting nice and arched, um, or getting round and breathe in that position. Um, and that way, when you go to stand up, you're not living in the cow position all mm. the time and compressing those same tissues over and over mm -hmm. again while you play. Awesome. I love it. And, um, you know, as soon as you said standing up, I was like, of course. And, and the, 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 the times I've had, well, I've had sitting back pain because of sitting with a footstool and lower back is like tweaked at an angle, but I haven't played with, yep, I play totally. with a cushion that holds up the guitar now to the mm -hmm. angle. I don't play with a footstool anymore because it was bad for my lower back and it was, you know, I was twisted at an angle of my lower back. Um, but standing, of course, imagine walking around with a weight hanging over your shoulder. Cause you're talking about position standing, but not even to mention the guitar hanging on a strap. And so if you just had a weight in the front of you hanging over your shoulder strapped over you for, you know, while you go on a walk or through the day, it's like, it's pulling you in a weird, and a guitar is even a weird uh, distribution of weight as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yes, I remember when I played in rock bands, so I was standing up every time I played, um, it would get real, the back would get real, weird and stiff and messed up yeah and yeah yeah right Absolutely. and tired's okay but it, it can add sure. up on you yes yeah. yes um so little guitar the guitar teacher side of this i would say um a potential you know you gotta try things and, and listen to your own body like we've been saying but having the guitar up higher on the strap mm -hmm. instead of lower which is better for your technique anyway and i think it looks cool I think like, you know, the it, it, I think it looks cool. I love the look of the guitar really high up. Like it's like right close to you and you're like can play better and, and move around better and stuff. You know, that low, that like as low as you can go alternative rock 90s thing, like it's clearly not, yes. that's not an intentional look anymore, but there's the whole spectrum in between. You know, are you going to go Beatles Ed Sullivan? Or are you going to go, um, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> offspring in the 90s? I like, um, so or yeah i think like i just the had a flashback from... to like how in the 90s we wore our backpacks like the longest strap all the way down yeah. our bodies oh yeah um, that was like the cool way to wear our backpacks and now i'm like how tight can i get this thing like how close to my oh, body can yeah. i get it a tight backpack <laughs> feels great right it's like right on your body <laughs> yes. i'll even tie the thing in the front you know the thing in the front so it's like uh, but yes i i my backpack was like below my butt in middle school it's yeah. like hanging low and you try and to you're walk probably or, the coolest kid because of it yeah and if you run it all like it's hitting against you yeah 
<laughs> yeah, who's cool? Whose backpack is lower? So yeah, you know, think of Chris, Chris Novoselic, the bass player of Nirvana, like in the live videos, and he's playing as low yeah. as physically possible. It's funny. Yeah. Um, but but anyway, I don't know have any. I don't have any knowledge of if that's actually worse for your back or not. But for me personally, having the guitar up is just better all around and. Sure. And uh, can yeah. yeah. The and other good the tip there is to yeah. to really feel your heels while you're standing. Make sure your knees are soft. Mm, feel your heels mm -hmm. on the floor. The more That's you're nice. on the balls of your feet, the more your hips can move forward. The more you're going to compress your low back. Um, yeah, being there is not bad. Being there for four hours not going to feel good. The strap that you use also makes a difference, at least for me, because uh, again, I used to perform standing up all the time in different bands, and I had this. I had several straps I would use, but one of the straps was like this design kind of advertised to be more comfortable because it was cushier it was cushier mm. softer kind of foam a little bit even flexy and that strap uh was maybe on first putting it on you're like oh yeah comfy cushy but after even an hour of playing it was way worse for my back and just so having just a a rigid you know non-flexible kind of leather strap ended up being the best feeling for me you know yeah. for that so yeah um, okay, Very, just a, a few more elbow pain. Anything unique? Anything unique about elbow issues for guitarists? Yeah, um, a lot. Uh, copy paste from tendonitis and wrist pain, basically. Okay. Um, elbow pain Strength. is often more related to shoulder position and and um, shoulder blade position and mobility, um, because your elbow is literally the other end of the same bone of your shoulder. Um, and um, a lot of times elbow pain is is tendonitis um, at oh. that, you know, the upper half of the same muscles that people tend to have it at their wrist. I see. Um, and then um, it can also be kind of like that nerve, like tingling kind of nummy kind of pain as well it happens at the elbow especially mm -hmm. like at that funny bone spot mm -hmm. um, funny bone is where your ulnar, known, ulnar nerve lives and that, that's what tingles it's not just a mm. funny bone. Um, okay. yeah. And so sometimes pain can kind of linger right around those nerve pathways that go through your elbow as well. Gotcha. Good to know. So definitely yeah. check out the tendonitis part where we talked about that. Load management yeah. is the thing there. It could be your other part. Yeah. Fitness in general, weightlifting, strength, also long recovery time potentially if you're already at the point of tendinosis, yeah. the, the new word of the day that I learned. I didn't know that was a word. But um, yeah. Okay, that's that's great. Yeah. Flying flying through forearm pain. This is something that people say, uh, but I think it's just probably tendonitis in the forearm. It can be tendonitis, and it's yeah. often nerve pain because oh, um, okay. the nerves will go. It starts, you know, at your neck, under your collarbone, by your shoulder, upper arm, and then they they branch off at different places. But uh, one of them goes by your funny bone area, and they branch off throughout your forearm. So different parts of your hand or different parts of your forearm can tell me what nerve might be irritated somewhere else up the chain. And okay. can we find a place of too much compression that we can take the pressure off so that nerve can then not give you so many messages about discomfort? Um, I see. Okay. So forearm pain and the kind of like tingling hands falling asleep often go together. Okay. Well, that was the next one on the list. So we'll just have those coupled together. Oh, there. yeah. We'll is combine them. A, yeah. Is this a pinched nerve thing? I hear people Basically. say pinched nerve. And is that is that... Are you doomed with a pinched nerve or is it like you can totally no. recover from it? Okay. I had a friend no. recently who was a athlete and he had a pinched nerve and he was, he was in, you know, doomsday mode, which I think we can mm. all get into, but he was implying that it's, he's stuck with it forever, but no, it's, oh. it's something you can. I hope you find somebody who can maybe give him some different language about it. Um, it, it stinks that a lot of people feel like they're in doomsday mode because mm. nerve pain hurts <laughs> mm, mm -hmm. um and it can turn into numbness and tingling and it's annoying and mm. it takes up a big part of like i sometimes i imagine our brain space like a pie chart it takes up a big part of our pie chart um mm. and so it, it captures a lot of our attention throughout the day and and it can bring us down it can bring it down um mm. But the solution is to find where is the nerve being made unhappy along the pathway of where it lives. It's n it's often not where you're having the pain. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the most classic one is carpal tunnel. The carpal tunnel is literally a tunnel where the, where your median nerve goes through. Um, and if that tunnel gets swollen, then anywhere past the tunnel 
gets either painful or weak or tingly or numb. Um, but that can happen anywhere. It can happen at the elbow. It can happen within the muscles of the forearm being too tight and compressive around the nerves. It can happen under the collarbone. It can happen at your neck itself. Um, and so that's where finding a PT or finding, a um, often like a physiatrist or a sports med doc, um, who can help you locate where the nerves are having the problem. You change the compression usually um, on that nerve, and then you get your feeling back. You get pain relief. Um, that's also one where you've got a little bit of that longer timeline that we talked about of like retraining your nerves to not be so on alert. Um, so it can be a little bit of a stickler, but absolutely changeable. Absolutely okay. changeable. You just got to find out where the problem is and how many sites. Sometimes it can be somebody can have carpal tunnel, but it also is impacted up by the shoulder too. So we have to find all the different places where a nerve might be kind of disturbed. And that was the thing I wanted to make sure we wrapped around too, is that it's possible for it to get better because yeah. we don't want anyone being in that doomsday mode and not, and, and just that it sounds pretty tricky to fix, but that it's fixable often. 100%. We can't say hundred, we can't it's, say, you know, everyone's situation is different, but like the typical version of it is, is fixable with physical therapy, with finding the spot that's getting pinched, probably exercises, fitness, flexibility, all the things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. That's but, the number one thing that I hear from instrumentalists at large is the forearm pain, tingling, numbness. My hands fall asleep too often. Is it that's, is that officially most carpal tunnel, tunnel or with. just it's a nerve it's, it's it's a nerve pinch somewhere? It's not carpal tunnel uh, always. All over. I see. Okay. Carpal tunnel is just yeah. the name for the version that's of what we're talking about in your wrist. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah, I haven't had that specific problem, but that's that's good to hear because oh, it would be very that's nerve annoying. issue tingling and stuff. It's like you start wondering about your, you know, it's like a nervous system, your brain response kind of. Th it's a very concerning, concerning. Th I have had that symptom before, just not from specifically guitar issues or a pinched nerve. But yeah, it's yeah. it's a freaky yeah. thing. Yeah, so yeah. so it is. Yeah. Well, it, interesting. I put it at the end if you say it's the most common thing, but um, but that's good to hear. Yeah, your thoughts on it, and and that you know if you get help and you're patient, you can find help. You can get that to to improve. So, anything else before we just kind of say, you know, where are you online and stuff, and we'll put links uh, in YouTube to your stuff and everything. We'll we'll do that in one sec. Is there just anything else after everything we've talked about that you want to add? that we either didn't get to or as kind of a closing message. And if not, that's fine. Um, I think I would just like to reiterate, find something fun that includes movement that is not the guitar mm -hmm. um, because the guitar is fabulous. I just would love for every guitar to guitarist to be able to move their bodies in a myriad of other ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think th that's building a resilient body through movement that is not playing the, playing your instrument is really kind of the the best preventive that we do have, um, mm -hmm. and things are gonna hurt from yeah. time to time. They do heal <laughs> when you find the solution for it. Okay. So, yeah. um, just you know, get a good support system and and yeah. Yeah. it'll be okay. Amazing takeaway. That's a that's a really good one. Uh, basically, don't have your only hobby. <laughs> B guitar <laughs> outside of sitting on the computer all day or something like yeah that's going to be recipe yeah. for for issues. And, yeah. I mean the the secondary effect of that is we don't have to be kind of destroyed in our identity if something's not going well. Um, big one, big one for a temporary amount of time, right? It's it's always nice to have more than one thing that you care about, you know, and just more of a general life thing here as as someone that likes to do projects and uh, it is nice because if one thing is going well if one thing is not going well, the other one can kind of, well, at least I have that other thing right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, it, this doesn't really contribute to my fitness at all, but I've been juggling a lot recently. I always juggled as a kid. I was, a, but um, it is good. It's movement and stuff, but I've, yeah. I bring it up because I, I've done it at the end of a few videos recently, just sharing, like I check out what I'm That's practicing so cool. with my juggling. Yeah. And um, I'm getting pretty good at four juggling four balls. So I'll demonstrate a, that in a video in the future. It's, it's starting <laughs> to feel, and I, and I, I don't consider it really 
good yet until I feel confident that I'm not going to drop it like at all. So I'm, I'm, okay. I'm like pretty solid with four, which is great. I always wanted to, I always juggled three balls and I'm doing tricks with them and stuff like that. But four is super fun. Next goal is five. Anyway, I'll, I'll demonstrate okay. on the channel in the future. So at the end of the videos, I, I'll, I'll share a little, here's how my juggling is going. It's, it's, a, it's it. an amazing break. I love it. You know, I get to, I just go in a different room and I'm standing and it's just moving your arms and you know, it's yeah. not, and it you literally like can't exercise. think of anything else cause you'll drop the balls. So you no, have I, to be a hundred percent focused. It doesn't you're really doing. take thinking I would say, but it takes a uh, well, you know, physical folk, physical coordination. Like yeah. I can listen to podcasts or something while I'm doing it or something. Yeah. But, okay. but, uh, it's it's fun it's just so it's a it's a okay. nice distract i'm a fidgety person it's like a distraction and uh or it's like something i can do it calms me down i should say it really calms me down it's nice so anyway great great ending i didn't mean to make that about me at the end with the with the juggling wow, but you great. know it's a i think it has helped me physically a little bit it's too. it's your you know, channel the, yeah that's true <laughs> and now an hour of juggling starting now um so where let's let's point people towards your stuff um you got your website which is www.forteperformancept.com okay it's a beautiful um, website i'm also and, what was that i was just saying it's a beautiful website and, and abby works oh. with a lot of clients and does remote sessions and stuff like that and because of a one video we did four years ago on my channel she gets guitar <laughs> clients from you know so uh, know. if if needed you know, she's a pro and uh and then instagram you're on there and yep forte performance pt that's kind of the social media uh platform on the, i'm on the most so mm -hmm. send me okay. a dm if you have any questions <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. And then she has a podcast called Play Life Loudly. Yeah. Get it? Forte? <laughs> is very good. Yeah. So I actually did not connect the Forte part. So excellent. It's nice if it's not too yes, obvious. Yes, you could listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Yeah. Um, awesome. This has been so good. Uh, I, I love... Uh, I. I love conversation, listening to conversations, interviews, stuff like that. Um, and something I've been wanting to do a little more of here and there um, on the channel and, and reaching out to people. And so I really appreciate you taking all your time, sharing all your expertise. This has been amazing. And the goal for this is just that it's a, a deep resource for anyone who might need, you know, any of the tidbits we've shared through this long conversation. And we're just going to put it up and you know, put it up on the channel. So just thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. And it's been great. Um, yeah, you're the go-to person for me in terms of if people are having issues, I send them your way because because it did the trick for me when I worked with you. So it's been great being in touch since then. So yeah, so thank I you so much. I appreciate that, Jared. This was so fun. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Talk to you soon. Okay. Okay, take care. Bye. I mentioned a couple times during this interview that there's a specific warm up that I do every single time I pick up the guitar. Before practicing, I always do this warm up exercise. I call it the best warm up, but it's just, you know, my favorite. It's what I use and it makes all the difference for me. I find it to be invaluable. It goes through every combination of fretting hand fingers. You can get a PDF of this exercise written out for you for free. You can use the link in the top of the description if you're watching on YouTube to get that PDF, or you can go to soundguitarlessons.com slash warm up it's written out with notation and tabs you don't have to be able to read music to benefit from it you can just slowly work out what are the finger combinations pretty simple concept uh, exercise but can take a while to get used to and it's amazing for our technique and it has there's a lot of different ways that you can work on this one thing and it's just worked for me for so long so i put it into a pdf so you can benefit from it too get that for free if you want to i post a new lesson video every week on my youtube channel follow subscribe let me know what you thought in the comments and i hope to see you in another video or episode soon thanks so much mm -hmm.